Kenny Pickett suggests the Steelers' offense is a play away from getting its mojo back. Are you buying it? Welcome to the Steelers update from Penn Live, where we keep track of all things Stellas, so you don't have to. This is John Lucy reporting. Steelers fans insist the root problem with the team's rotten offense is clueless coordinator Matt Canada. Steelers Nation made their feelings known in no uncertain terms with full-throated Fire Canada chants raining down from the Acrisure Stadium stands on Monday night. Coach Mike Tomlin says the stymie Steelers offense simply has to get its mojo back. Quote, we've got to get that mojo that we had in the preseason where we're playing fast and fluid with confidence. We lost that, to be blunt, in the last several weeks, unquote. Tomlin said that following the Steelers' 26-22 victory over the rival Browns under those primetime lights. But isn't that something somebody says when he doesn't really know what the problem is? In truth, the Steelers' offense is suffering from a severe touchdown drought, and it has been for quite a while. As Jerry Dulac writes in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, Monday's game marked, quote, the second time this season, the fifth time in Kenny Pickett's last seven starts, and the 15th time in 36 games since Canada has been coordinator that the offense hasn't scored more than one touchdown in a game, unquote. If it wasn't for the defense, who out-touchdowned the offense 2-1, to one, the Steelers would be sitting at 0-2 right now. Most of the blame is being laid at the feet of coordinator Canada. Yes, he called that horrible 3rd-1 and one play late in the game with the outcome on the line that had Pickett keep the ball, only to be slammed down for a 3-yard loss. This brought the Fire Canada chance to, the, to a fever pitch. A contingent of fans in the upper deck unfurled a Fire Canada banner just in case anyone was missing the message. Tomlin didn't miss it, but he's also refusing to act upon it. While acknowledging that two poor offensive performances in a row makes for a problematic pattern, he said, quote, we're not going to have knee-jerk reactions in terms of making wholesale changes in an effort to change that outcome, unquote. As for all those fans in the stadium calling for Canada's head, well, Tomlin said such full-throated criticism is the prerogative of Pittsburgh fans, who he aims to keep, quote, fat and sassy and spoiled, unquote. But as the late great Myron Cope used to say when the Steelers' attack was sputtering, that Steelers' offense is from hunger. No wonder these empty stomach Steelers fans are loudly airing their offensive discontent. Not only do they want Canada gone, they want Jalen Warren to displace Najee Harris as the Steelers' starting running back. And they want to oust Dan Moore Jr. at left tackle to plug in the highly touted rookie first-round draft pick Broderick Jones, who's been riding the pine these past two games. At the center of it all, however, is Kenny Pickett. The promise of his second year glittered so brightly throughout his perfect preseason. But ever since the footballs have been flying for real, Pickett has been beset by accuracy problems, questionable decision making, and an unsettling level of panic that has been far too apparent in his play. Pickett is far from the only Steeler standing by Canada, but Pickett has the most at stake. For if Canada was let go, then the full attention of fans would be focused upon him. This would be anything but a comfortable position for Pickett, at least based upon the quarterback's erratic play so far this season. So among all those people attempting to diagnose the root cause of the Steelers' offensive ills, Pickett, too, has named a disease that he says has been playing his team's ability to produce points. For Pickett, it's the one negative play that seems to negate every Steelers drive. Said Pickett, quote, it's the one play that gets us behind the chains. It seems like we're moving the football. We're having plays. We're getting explosive plays. And then we have that one negative that sets us behind the chains and we don't 
execute after that. We've got to eliminate those plays, continue to move the ball forward, stay ahead of the chains, and put us in third and manageable instead of third and 11 plus, unquote. By Pickett's analysis, the Steelers' offense is but a play away from putting it all together and lighting it up the scoreboard. In truth, we, we even did see this on Monday night amid all that offensive futility. There was that one play where Pickett stood tall in the pocket, went through his progressions, and fired a perfect strike on stride to George Pickens, who was streaking across the middle of the field. The result was an electrifying 71-yard catch-and-run score that had the Acrosure crowd cheering rather than chanting in the second quarter. This was a prime example of the kind of offensive fireworks all of Pittsburgh had been expecting to see with both Pickett and Pickens entering their second year. These two were supposed to be the coming of the the second coming of the prolific point scoring tandem of Ben Roethlisberger and Antonio Brown. Antonio, by the way, has volunteered his services as a coordinator replacement for Canada. I hope he's not sitting by the phone. Unfortunately, Pickett's notion that the Steelers are one play away should really be turned on its head. In, instead, he and the Steelers often seem to be good for only one play a game. It's the same with the running game, where Warren does seem to have some more pop than that former first rounder, Harris. As Dulac notes in his art article articulating the Steelers' offensive futility, the Steelers produced just 55 rushing yards on Monday night. Of those, quote, 38 came on back-to-back -back runs by Harris, and that means the other 19 rushes netted just 17 yards total, unquote. Heading into the season, a major point of emphasis was supposed to be increasing the Steelers' point production in the red zone. Forget that. On Monday, the Steelers' offense never even sniffed the red zone. The closest they got was around the 30-yard line all game long. If the Steelers' offense were a car, it would be a smoke-spewing, stall-prone jalopy that the owner spends more time pushing than driving. It operates in fits and starts, and the vast majority of the time, it simply stops cold. As Dulac pointed out, just seven plays produced 202 of the Steelers' 255 yards against the Browns. As long as the offense sputters like this, the elusive mojo that Mike Tomlin longs to recapture will remain just that. So will the touchdowns and probably the wins. After all, you can't rely on the defense, as fantastic as it was on Monday, to produce multiple touchdowns every week. Maybe Pickett will figure out. Maybe he'll weed out those nettlesome negative plays that he blames for all the offensive futility. But the fact of the matter is, Pickett has yet to produce a full game where he puts it all together and reliably orchestrates sustained drives that result in multiple scores. In short, Kenny Pickett has yet to prove he's a starting quarterback in the NFL. This point seems to get lost in Pittsburgh, a football town with a Matt Canada fixation, but a Kenny Pickett problem. Now, we have much more on Pickett in the offense, plus the lowdown on that game-saving defense in this Take the Win edition of your Steelers Update podcast. Hey, and be sure to catch my print column first thing Thursday on Penn Live. It will be packed with plenty of memes bringing the latest, greatest Steelers debates to life and to laughs. Right now, let's get right to it. Without further delay, we get to that pair of Pittsburgh heroes who rescued that win against the Brownies. I'm talking about perhaps the best pass rushing tandem in all of the NFL, T.J. Watt and Alex Highsmith. Here, Mike DeFabo with The Athletic takes us behind the scenes of those two Pittsburgh pass rushers and how they made all the difference Monday night. DeFabo writes, quote, if you're looking to award a game ball after the Steelers' 26-22 victory over the Browns, good luck picking between Watt and Highsmith. 
on the night that Watt recorded sack number 81.5 to overtake James Harrison for the franchise record, his counterpart might have even had a greater game and a more game-wrecking force. Together, they helped will the Steelers to victory on a night when their shorthanded defense got even thinner and the offense was largely inept, and by the end of it, a large swath of fans loudly chanted for offensive coordinator Matt Canada to be fired. Said Tomlin, quote, we needed it. We expect it, and they delivered. Speaking of, of course, Watt and Highsmith. The Steelers locked in their dynamic duo of pass rushers this offseason when they inked Highsmith to a four-year, $68 million contract extension. That highly compensated pair made their presence felt almost as soon as the ball was kicked off on Monday night. On the Browns' first play from scrimmage, Highsmith snatched a deflected Deshaun Watson pass out of the air and returned it 31 yards for the score, his first touchdown since Pop Warner. Later, in the closing minute of the first half, Watt made history. He entered the game tied with James Harrison after recording three sacks in week one against the 49ers. And then he blew past Brown's rookie right tackle, Dewan Jones, and that impressive 87-inch wingspan and dragged Watson down by the toe. Watts sprinted to midfield and uncorked his signature leg kick, this time with a little extra on it. Quote, I'd be lying to you if I said it wasn't special, Watts said of that record-breaking sack for the Steelers' history. After the impact that both of these edge rushers made in the first half, maybe it was fitting that they converged to produce the game-deciding play. In the middle of the fourth quarter, the Steelers' defensive anthem renegade blared. The terrible towels swirled. The faithful whipped themselves into a frenzy, and the Browns set up for second and nine at their own 20-yard line. Quote, I just kind of had a feeling that it was going to be play action. Highsmith said that was just before crashing the line and knocking the football free from the opposite side. Watt was coming off a chip block and saw it all unfold. Quote, thankfully, I didn't dive on it. I was able to scoop it and score it. And the place went bananas. Unquote. It sure did. And those two secured the win for the Steelers. The bottom line for Watt and the Steelers and DeFabio, who wrote that great article for The Athletic and Highsmith, quote, we want to be a defense that determines the outcomes of games, unquote. That's T.J. Watt. And the actions of Watt and Highsmith sure did that on Monday night. And thank God they did because, you know, the the actual uh, chance uh, of all of those chants that the Steelers fans made loudly heard on Monday night and all of the national commentators were, were seizing upon Matt Canada and the, and the prospect that he probably should be fired. But what's the prospect that he will be? axed by the Steelers. For that answer, we turn to Mark Caboli with The Athletic, and it's an answer Steelers fans probably won't appreciate too much. Camboli writes this, quote, the Steelers don't typically fire coaches in, during the season. For anything comparable, you'd have to go back to 1998 when Bill Cowher stripped Ray Sherman of his play calling duties late in the season and let him go in the offseason. Tomlin showed a little more concern than usual, but he appears nowhere near the point of making a, a call like that on Canada. Even though Tomlin has routinely said he's a part of all aspects of the team, Tuesday might have been the first time he alluded to the idea that he has more influence on the offensive game plan than a quick once-over after Canada puts the final touches on it. 
And let's put it this way. Tomlin has always had Canada's back. He's brought him back each of the last two seasons, despite an offense that wasn't very good. He could have easily moved on from Canada this offseason with the picket era set to start in earnest, but he decided not to. In wake of the offensive struggles Monday night, Tomlin stopped short of blaming Canada alone. He suggested the offense needs to be more flexible and to adjust and better anticipate how a defense might counter a game plan. Tomlin pointed to the Browns' defense early in the game, saying it showed looks that the Steelers weren't anticipating and weren't able to adjust to quickly enough. But the real concerning part with the Steelers' offense has been Pickett himself. He's anywhere from 26th to 30th among qualifying quarterbacks in QBR, completion percentage, interceptions, touchdowns, yard per attempt, and net yards, unquote. In other words, he's bottom of the barrel right now in the NFL. And the bottom line here from this great Kaboli article on the very unoccurring chance, I mean, it's not going to happen that Canada's fired midseason. There's going to be no simple solutions to these Steelers' offensive ills. Everybody's groping to try to put their finger on the problem, but... You know, as Chuck Noll once says, the problems are great and they are many. And it starts with Kenny Pickett getting back to the accuracy that we saw in the preseason. Because right now, he's erratic and he seems to have a little panic in him, you know, when you look at him in, in some of these games. And, of course, these first two games, he, f- he faced some uh, pretty stalwart defenses. So we'll see where he goes from here. But let's move on and let's get some good news. And that comes on the health of Steelers star safety Minka Fitzpatrick. He was last seen headed to the hospital with a chest injury sustained Monday night. But the Post-Gazette tells us, uh, gives us a positive sounding report and update on Minka. It comes from Ray Fittipaldo, who writes this, quote, Mike Tomlin said during his weekly news conference on Tuesday that safety Minka Fitzpatrick escaped serious injury after being evaluated at the hospital Monday night for that chest injury. According to Tomlin, Fitzpatrick was taken to the hospital, quote, out of an abundance of caution. Tomlin also said Fitzpatrick was back in the Steelers training room on the south side Tuesday receiving treatment. Quote, based on the information I have here today, they feel good about where he is, Tomlin told the media. We'll see where the weeks lead us, unquote. The Steelers do lose a day of preparation this week due to playing on Monday night, and these injured players like Minka could have a harder time recovering for Sunday night's game in in Vegas. Quote, on a shorter week, those who are dealing with injuries, it's a tougher train to get on, Tomlin said. We'll make plans around those who are healthy and available to us, unquote. Now, the Steelers have been hit hard by the injury bug early in the season. Star defensive end Cam Hayward had surgery to repair an injured groin muscle, and he'll be out up to eight weeks while he rehabilitates. Also, receiver Deontay Johnson and running back Anthony McFarlane both were placed on IR. They're not eligible to return to the active roster until the October 22nd game against the Rams in L.A., unquote. So there you have it. All the latest news on the triage uh, going on with the Steelers and some positive news on Minka, but we might not see him. Sunday night. But whatever, who's ever playing and who's ever healthy and whatever picket can put together to to iron out that offense, it's on to Vegas and the Raiders. May the odds be in the Steelers' favor. May we hear go Steeler chants instead of fire Canada chants from the many Pittsburghers, the 412ers, who are sure to be in the stands in Vegas. But however the chips fall, we're going to cover it all right here on your Steelers Update podcast. So sign up, 
wherever you get your podcast, get it automatically. It's fresh every Wednesday afternoon, steaming with fresh takes on the latest, greatest Steelers debates coming right out of the 412 area code. And of course, log on to penlive.com anytime for your real-time Steelers news. And go Steelers, beat those Raiders.